So thank you everyone for, um, for coming today. It's really, really exciting to be able to talk about this, this, set, this set of issues in front of a, a crowd of, of young people because I really do think that the solutions to the problems that we've been discussing here are going to be in your hands. We are facing, I think, a, a, a prolonged period in which we will have to all be very vigilant about what's happening in the media space and how that media space is affecting our, democrat our democratic space and the way our societies work and are organized. It's been a really, really rapid descent in the last few years. And one of the things, we, we did this uh, book that several people were able to get a copy of. We brought a few copies. Um, a, few, a few months ago, we published this. Uh, it was a very quickly organized book put together by different people who are working on this. And one of the things that really came out in the process of putting this book together quite quickly on media capture was how incredibly fast this environment has changed. It really started only in 2008. Most of you, I guess, were, don't remember 2008. But for me, 2008 was a really dramatic year because we had the global financial crisis. And during that time of crisis, media companies in particular uh, really had a hard time. And this, uh, during that period, a lot of media companies changed hands because they became very cheap. And, and the way that media capture interacts with technology was also a really important part of this story because that was also the time when we started to see the intermediaries like Facebook and Google taking a giant share of the revenue that used to, to pay for the production of high quality content. So that process of weakening through the financial crisis, having the intermediaries come into the media space and grab all the advertising dollars, and we're talking billions of dollars, that has really destroyed local media in many parts of the world, including in this country. How many people know how, how many newspapers have failed in the United States? It's a tremendous number of small local newspapers that, were, uh, that have disappeared. So, and it has not been brought back, that coverage of local news, of what's happening at City Hall and what's happening to our local communities has not been replaced by, by uh, social media. So that whole process is what we talk about in this book about media capture. And that's why we wanted to bring this topic to, to, to discussion here because we're thinking it's having a tremendous impact on the future of, of of our democracies and our and our organizations as as uh, as human beings, and it's it's a global phenomenon. One of the most interesting facts that we've been able to gather over the over these couple of years that we've been working on it is to, is to be able to measure the extent of this. And I would say that media capture, where the where oligarchs and highly influential financial players at the country level, private sector people are working with politicians to control public opinion. That, that model has become the dominant model of media ownership across the world. They're, they're, very, they're a shrinking number who do not fall under that kind of uh, ownership model. Um, the um, Central European University is about to release a study that looks at 20 countries and it shows that 75% of the, of the papers, of the media companies in those environments fall under that model. Um, there was another uh, study by the uh, organization that, uh, of, of um, cooperative uh, investigative journalists that studied 11 countries. And 41% of the, of the media companies in those 11 countries were held by private, unknown, offshore companies. Uh, another 27% um, was owned by politicians, and another 10% were owned by known criminals. So that leaves a tiny percent of the media in the hands of people who are trying to serve the public interest. And at the same time that all this is going on, um, a public service media, which used to be the, the model that dominated many countries, has really been collapsing in many countries. I mean, in Hungary and Poland, that was one of the first things that, that these regimes that we heard from uh, Gabor and others, these, these were the first things to go. So these, this, this new model of ownership has really become the way it is 
is happening. So what we're going to use this really wonderful panel we have here today uh, for our last session to talk about is what to do about this and how some of the frontline activists are reacting to this because there is an army of people across the world who are working on this. And it's really interesting that uh, we have been able to connect with a lot of those people. They have, they have ideas and they have, um, um, they have plans. They're trying to make it happen. And um, I, think, I think I might start um, with, my, with my colleague from the National Endowment for Democracy, Miriam Lanskoy, who is the director for uh, the work in, in, in Russia and other parts of the world, because the NED is one of those institutions that is working on this problem and doing it from a, from a multifaceted point of view, not just helping journalists and media organizations, but also civil society organizations that are really critical to kind of building this wall and trying to create some kind of space for independent voices to be heard in country. So I'm, I want to just add, let, let uh, Miriam say a few words about what we are doing at the NED, and we'll come back on uh, uh, for several passes through the uh, panel, so you don't have to have your whole presentation okay. uh, on the first time around. Okay, okay so I'm going to limit myself now to the media part, and we'll come back to other. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so thank you so much, uh, Mark, and and I'm grateful to Indiana University and to um, SEMA for organizing this. And I thought the first panel was fantastic, and you put a lot of great things on the table already. Um, so the, the challenge has um, uh, largely been defined. Uh, it's more and more difficult for independent media to do their work. And what is it that we can do? Um, I, I work in the grant making part of NED and we um, provide support uh, for civil society and a lot of it really goes to uh, media. And that's one of the things that's not um, stressed enough about the NED is uh, a third of our budget go every year goes to um, support for independent media. We're, we're very well known for civil society and human rights groups, but we, um, and, and the way that we tend to do it is direct assistance to media, meaning not just um, training or equipment or some kind of one-off projects, but to support what media organizations, their actual function, their, their work. Um, we value um, independence and um, the, the, the importance, important stories, breaking important stories that have resonance, that are agenda setting, um, and, and permitting them to, revert, to, to be amplified and reverberate beyond uh, um, their uh, maybe initial countries. So um, I focus on Russia, and as, as Natalia Arno has pointed out already, um, many of the most important stories are broken still by Russian journalists. So if you take a story, she pointed out the, um, the military, the presence of Russian military in Ukraine, which was broken by uh, Pskovska Gubernia, it's a local Russian newspaper. Right now, um, Russian casualties in Syria that the Russian government has wanted to um, uh, not be upfront about. They haven't quite denied it, but you know, there's there's substantial Russian casualties in, in Syria uh, over the last week or so, uh, and they're being identified by Nova Gazeta and by um, so-called information activists, not even necessarily media, but um, groups of journalists using very sophisticated kind of open source research methods where they're using um, social media to analyze um, and identify uh, uh, Russian, Russian soldiers who, who were killed in Syria just now. So these are remarkably important stories. Uh, and the same goes for the Troll Factory. Um, but they need to be amplified. And they, need, they absolutely depend on um, a free and secure internet. And we'll come back to kind of questions of um, uh, uh, um, uh, internet governance and, and what social what what does what is it that civil society and the media um, need from from the internet? But I would say that much of our strategy at this point is digital, and the more authoritarian the country, the more of your 
um, media programs um, are in the internet space because so, so capture is is usually um, more um, solidified in the in the um, print and uh, broadcast media, but there's still more opportunity on the internet, especially in social media. And I just want to say, in in Mark has said about um, with relevance to to the U.S. If uh, media sustainability is not possible in a developed market economy and a democracy, which is what we're finding here, sustainability is not certainly not possible in developing semi-authoritarian parts of the world where we work. So, and, and that has been, the attitude among many donors has been um, that direct assistance undermines kind of long-term sustainability and distorts the market. And what, what we're finding is even even here, um, the the market is simply not, the, the, the financial viability of the media is, is in a lot of trouble. Um, so donors really need to step up in a number of different contexts. So I'll stop. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really important point, and it shows that there are different kinds of environments out there, too, uh, where this problem is particularly acute. I mean, you know, where where you work in particular in Russia and Eurasia, the the ability of these companies to survive is really under threat right now. And so, um, direct assistance is a really critical way of trying to keep them going until there can be some other break in the system and to think about what other um, possibilities there are for sustaining and supporting media. I mean, I want to go to Alex now because Alex works. Alex Dardelli is the executive vice, vice president for strategy and development at IREX. IREX is one of the big players <clears throat> in the United States, a company, uh, an organization that, that does um, media development work across the world. And they have gone through a really important rethinking of what they do in this environment because this environment is drastically different than it used to be. I mean, I was involved in my career training journalists after the, after the, um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I went to Poland, Hungary, Czech, Czech Republic for the World Bank. And um, it was like taking uh, candy to babies at that time. You know, the, the demand was high. People really wanted to learn. There was an incredible optimism about uh, what could be done. And people learned, and they, they they changed the way they operated, and it's a really it was a really really positive story for many years in that part of the world. But today we have a much more complex environment where those kinds of scenarios don't present themselves as much anymore. And I think IREX has been doing some thinking about that. And I wanted to give Alex a chance to say a few words about that rethinking that you've been doing about what to do in this environment. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and thank you, Dean Feinstein. Thank you, Carl, for this timely and very important discussion. Um, and I couldn't agree more. The issue of the survival of the entities that produce healthy, vibrant information is going to be with us for quite some time. And it's critical to many things, including the survival of democracy and prosperity, the marketplace. So we at IREX run this index. It's an annual tool called Media and Sustainability Index. We've run it for the past 15 years in partnership with the United States Agency for International Development. And it's rich in data because it's not just the product of one or two researchers based on desk research or just polling. It's actually done on a country level by a panel of 12 respected local experts, journalists, media professionals, civil society, in each of the 22 countries of Eurasia. We're very proud of it. But it has also made us think that so far we've been talking about the media. And that's great. We believe in independent media, in its indispensability for democracy and prosperity and functioning markets. But I don't think that the discussion is, is sufficient. We need to talk about another angle of the spectrum, and that's the angle of information. Think of it this way. Every day, the world produces 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. For those of you who are data geeks, that means 250,000 libraries of Congress <laughs> every day. So 
it is increasingly clear that the news media, the traditional news media, has no monopoly on the generation or dissemination of information. Indeed, there are some futurists that say by 2020, most of the data and information will be produced by machines that talk to <coughs> one another. And yet here we are, faced with this annoying, that doesn't go away, problem of fake news. And many folks are resigned to this annoyance and are looking for solutions to artificial intelligence. Indeed, we hear that Google and Facebook are actually investing in developing trust indicators. Now, clearly, faced with this massive universe of information, a lot of it being created by you, me, us, the world, we can use any help that we can get. They are welcome to do this. However, technology is rarely a full solution to any problem. A and indeed, some would argue that Facebook and Google may be the problem, and may be the information flood. Uh, we think that betting on artificial intelligence for solutions to the issue of healthy, vibrant information is the wrong bet. We need a different kind of bet. That bet is on the human mind, actually. And that bet is on durable, critical information consumption skills. And what do we mean by this? We basically mean that we navigate the information universe. The best bet, the best compass, is the human mind. The stakes are really high. We've discussed with Mark in other fora. A and they are high in many ways. We cannot abdicate our responsibility for critical thinking to artificial intelligence, to an organization, to a government, to an entity, be that media. Uh, this is a critical responsibility of citizenship. Um, and it's indispensable to many things. It's indispensable to democracy, functional elections, uh, peaceful transitions of power, functioning markets, uh, civic initiatives, community life, politics in general. It's important to say that free citizens, good neighbors, saving consumers, are not just born that way. They are developed, they are cultivated through education, through learning, through trial, through error. Um, and, and vibrant democracy, vibrant information actually, um, it's, it's critical to effective government, to the services we receive, to the way we interact with one another, to how we participate in markets. Without good information, without healthy information, the entire edifice of rules, practices, behaviors, institutions in which modern life and democracy exist may collapse. In fact, actually, we think that there is a direct correlation between political dysfunctionality in many Western democracies and the absence of healthy information and low critical information consumption skills. And the, the group that is most at risk is really our children. So by giving them mobile, mobile devices and technology, we really have thrown them into rough information seas without quite teaching them how to swim in these seas. And they are, despite these temporary content controls and you know, the plethora of mini initiatives about critical thinking, they are at the mercy of the waters. And we need to think hard about this issue. We really need a renaissance um, in information literacy, in these durable, critical information consumption skills, with a particular focus on children and youth, and I mean by youth up to 16, 17, sort of the, the secondary level of education, um, with a focus on how to select and identify sources, how to identify your own confirmation bias, how to detect emotional manipulation and hate speech, how to debunk video that is false, data that is clearly and patently false. And then as they mature, talk a bit more about the, the political economy of information. I think that if we truly believe the maxim that information is a currency of democracy, we'd better put the money where our mouth is. Now, we at IREX base this on some initiatives, uh, and Mark is aware of one of them, actually. We, we have run this initiative in Ukraine, which, by the way, has been at the forefront of fighting, fighting fake news and disinformation for, for decades now. Um, and we call it Learn to Discern. We're now in its second iteration. And the second iteration is focused squarely on high schoolers in Ukraine, and it's countrywide. But we recently conducted an impact study of its first iteration that was not focused on high schools. We went back a year and a half later, 
after the program finished and said, did the participants who took part in our program, do they indeed have durable critical information skills because of this program? And then what are they able to do with it? So we selected 200 uh, participants in a poll countrywide and two non 200 non-participants and we uh, tested their capability to deal with information. We gave them a true story, we gave them fake news and then we asked them about who controls media, how does the business of media operate and what is the ownership layer be behind each story, advertorial content and editorial positions, as well as their role, their ownership of whether they take action to critically consume information. And the results are fascinating and I think very promising. With regard to whether they detect a fake news, a fake story or not, the ability of the participants in the program was about 12% higher than non-participants. With regard to who controls the story, who pays for it, what's the mechanics behind the creation of the information, there was a market difference of 26%. Now, if you think, especially of a young population, chi children and youth, these are huge numbers, and there's tremendous promise in these numbers. So, to answer your question, Professor Helmke, maybe this is the ray of hope in this bleak picture. The focus on the human mind, on critical information consumption skills, and that's our long-term bet. Thank that's, you. That's a, that's a really important point, and it's, a, it's an interesting one also about the the vast quantity of information, you know, and one of the things is that information was always uh, out there and in vast quantities, but the media was playing a really, really important role of bringing it to the top. The news media was bringing it to uh, people's attention and, and sifting through it and helping people to see things that were important to them um, uh, every day. I re you know, I remember the meetings and, uh, that I used to participate in at the Wall Street Journal and also at the St. Petersburg Times where I started off as a young journalist. Um, you would go to a meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning and all these people would be sitting around the table thinking about what is it that people in St. Petersburg, Florida need to know today? What are, what, what are the things that are important to them and what do we want on page one? What are the key issues that we... And that function of editing and thinking through is, is, is going to be replaced by something else. And we need to be thinking about that and helping people un understand and analyze and how to, um, how to navigate this new environment. I want to turn to uh, Maxine uh, Tanya Hamada, who is a, um, uh, a Philippine um, uh, activist, and uh, she's, she's uh, the corporate secretary for the Institute of Leadership. She's been a, a, um, a fellow at, at NED for the past six months, and she's aware of what's going on in her home country, the Philippines. And I'm, I'm wondering what, how this uh, affects your interpretation of this environment. You've gone through this incredible change of leadership, and, and leadership. there's been some really brave Philippine organizations that have been working in this environment. And I, I, would, I just wanted to give you a chance to react a little bit to what you've heard so far. Yeah, I'd like to tie it in to, to continue the, the discussion in terms of you have a lot of data, but I guess I'm not a media practitioner, I'm not a media owner, I don't work in the media space, but I would be what you'd call one of those or from those sectors that need the media the most because most of the work we do depends on stories. It's telling the story, getting the idea across, you know, selling democracy, selling human rights. It's a story, it's not the data. And we normally turn to media. Oftentimes, we take it for granted. And so in this particular crisis in the Philippines, it's a very important time for us to reflect really on what, how, what are the roles of media. As, we, as, I've, as I've mentioned to many colleagues during the Regan Fasel Fellowship, we need media to accompany this crucial uh, challenge to democracy in the Philippines. Whether we're backsliding or we can reconsolidate, we need media there. But then there's this painful realization that we also need to accompany media if we want it to accompany the narrative. But what do we mean uh, when we say we need to accompany media? Usually, Regan Fasel Fellows, you're either a scholar, a practitioner, or an activist. If you're an activist, you bring you know, the real difficult 
challenges to democracy to the attention of these. If you're a scholar, you bring the thoughts, the, you know, the analysis and the discourse. If you're a practitioner, you usually bring your stories and then you bring your questions. So my question really was in media development, how do we now, you know, how do we define these roles, civil society and media, this interdependence of uh, freedom of the press, uh, opening of civic spaces? What, what, how do we now define this and how do we move forward together? Um, in the Philippines, there is this small, uh, in the Philippines, there are three stories of media that you will find uh, highlighted around the world. The first that came out after the change of the administration was a particular visual one. They called themselves the night crawlers. They were the photojournalists who had no choice but to document each and every ex uh, what, extrajudicial killing that happened when it started in the Philippines. Uh, they were our first line to the names, the identities, the data you know, that was happening as, as, as it was happening. We were all in shock. We couldn't believe that this was happening. So the photojournalists were our first uh, expression of media, independent media. And then you had the bloggers. You know, uh, the elections of 2016 were pretty much like you know, what happened in, in many parts of the, of the world. You know, there was this upsurge of online influencing. And you had influencers, particularly bloggers. In the Philippines, what, what, what is happening now is it's a clash of bloggers. You have bloggers who are trying to hold the line. And you, are, you have bloggers who are using state apparatus for disinformation. So it's a very interesting, again, question to bring forward to practitioners, uh, to media savvy people like you. How do we define this space? The third story is what I wanted to share th this afternoon. It's a small, scrappy media outfit in the Philippines. Its name is Rappler. Um, it's coined from the words rap, which means to discuss, and ripple, which is to cause, you know, uh, influence by discussing things. So Rappler is a small, scrappy media outfit that is not, is, that is specifically online. It was one of the early adopters of, you know, the, the media space is changing and therefore we have to adopt. They became alpha partners of uh, Facebook. They, ha they, they believed, you know, in the ca capacity of the uh, online media space and networking. But then they started, you know, in, in the one thing that Rappler had, I think, that um, kept its integrity is that from the very beginning, its, its emphasis was really on editorial excellence and independence. So even if it was an online outfit, you could see that the founders, their very DNA was all about editorial integrity. And so that continued, and now that's what got Rappler into trouble. Because under a political you know, transition, you have to keep your, your integrity. You have to hit when you have to hit. And then you know the whole machinery that Rappler was using to move its online, uh, its online reach suddenly turned against it. It became the victims of trolling, of fake news, of accusations. You know, uh, the head of Rapper would get 90 attacks per minute. They were able to map cells where in 23 um, accounts were able to control millions of uh, Facebook uh, accounts. So in this environment, the next step, you know, what they, were, they kept their critical ability and their commentary. What, what, what happened in the Philippines that made it now the main story of media in the Philippines is that their license to operate was canceled. So you see, the, the, the complexity of now, uh, of, of, a, of a media landscape, especially for us who are not in the media environment, is that when I first heard the news, um, candidly, I wasn't concerned really about Rappler because I thought, you know, this Rappler can handle. My first instinct was to see, what's the community saying? Did anybody stand up for Rappler? Did anybody see this as a push against media freedom? Because if not, that would be the problem for me. And, and I share it now in, you know, in a more optimistic sense because the response has been amazing. In the Philippines, you had local campaigns of I stand with Rappler. Um, I still have to verify right with Rappler, but I hope that you know, their, ind their independent donations page got more hits after that uh, decision. Uh, and then international uh, commentary from some of the most established newspapers around the world, you know, they, they right away asked the right questions. They did not say that this is, you know, this is a curtailment of press freedom, but they asked the right questions. Is this a curtailment of press freedom? They did not go towards the legalese of the Rappler, you know, uh, follow the procedures of its uh, corporate responsibility and they, they just ask the important question and so I think particularly in a forum like this those are the questions that, and the stories that I would want to contribute that there is a way to push back 
there is a way to invest in this scrappy independent you know uh, media uh, in, in uh, institutes but also there is a way to define again you know this emerging role of media and i think the philippines will be one of the areas where it will be exciting to watch moving yeah forward. i think it's also the philippines was also one of the places that had incredibly fast development of its media environment mm -hmm. during a certain period of time. It, 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 institutions emerged that focused on investigative journalism and you reformed your, your media space. And that's one of the things that I want to turn to our next speaker who is uh, Marco Larissa from the World Bank. The World Bank is the organization that works around the world to engage with governments to reform their governance systems and to uh, try to shore up the public sector role in this because the public sector, whether we like it or not, plays a really important role in this in this environment. The public sector and the and the government um, has to get involved in the media environment because, for example, broadcast spectra have to be divided, and how those broadcast spectra for TV and radio are divided becomes an area of, of governance. Uh, is it divided free? Is it divided in a way that is uh, free and fair and open, or is it divided by payments and, and corruption? And what we're seeing in the in the governance of media across the world today is that it's becoming more and more captured by this system, where the governments and oligarchs are colluding with each other and taking control. So we uh, we are really excited about the fact that the World Bank this year published a really important large study that put a lot of emphasis on media as one of the solutions and one of the areas that needs to be looked at very seriously as part of the governance uh, um, system in countries, so that as a way for um, the World Bank to engage in this uh, debate with governments and to try to make the case to governments that media governance really matters. So, uh, Marco, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about this and how you see this problem from your perspective. We have another round, so I can focus on a few things and then come back some patterns later, right? Yes, yes. I don't want to yes. speak for too long. But, uh, yes. I'm not as well organized as uh, Alexandre, so I actually had a copy of the report, but it's in the, it's in the other bag. So, okay. <laughs> anyway, I will uh, send you the link. Uh, the, the report that uh, uh, Marx is referring to is. Uh, the last uh, World Development Report. Uh, actually, no, it's not the last. Uh, it's uh, the from 2017. Speak, speak loudly. Yeah, it's it, from 2017, yeah. the report on governance and the law. And uh, this uh, uh, this report gives us a, like a foundation uh, that allows also to contextualize this discussion on the media. And uh, mm, the report brings uh, power at the center of the development uh, challenges. So the notion of power and power asymmetries in societies as uh, the underlying constraints for countries to basically adopt and implement uh, effective policies. In the bank, when you think and you talk about power, everybody thinks you talk about electricity. So <laughs> you have to start with this idea that we, we, you know, for some audiences, like political scientists, been discussing these issues for 40 years. Uh, in the bank, there is still uh, a lot of resistance, and uh, there is a different background for most of the professionals that that uh, still believes that there are certain areas in which you should not engage. Now, this, you know, of course, you know, the bank has come a long way, uh, and governance has become a more and more uh, important uh, cross-cutting agenda. And so the decision to have a, a report that brings politics to the center was, um, I think, quite timely, and uh, given also the, 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 the the, 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 the impact that report is uh, having all over the world, I think we are on the right track. I mean, this is the, now the most uh, downloaded publication of the bank. Of the yeah. entire, although the publication that the bank has done, this is the most downloaded publication. And I think this is, uh, gives an idea about the interest of the topic. What, where we bring the media in the picture is about the fact that media can be an actor of change and, of course, also being like a defendant on the status quo. So, I mean, I will not give into all the negative side, which was covered by the previous uh, uh, panel, but um, we also emphasize there is a lot of uh, uh, experience in countries that show that media can be a powerful actor for change, especially when they act in alliances with other stakeholders in society. And uh, the, um, what we, the perspective that we use basically is to uh, make the case that uh, uh, media are in, in fact uh, you know, is an important actor to 
uh, activate the power of transparency. So uh, we emphasize a lot as donors, as international organization, the potential role of transparency. You know, we just, uh, Alexander was alluding to that. The fact that you, you know, put information out there and you change the incentives of policy makers, and uh, this is supposed to create a lot of accountability, uh, virtuous dynamics. Uh, well, the experience of many countries shows that, yes, transparency makes information available, so it's the first condition, is that you need some sort of enabling environment, otherwise you cannot start uh, investigation, you cannot uh, start uh, many other things, and I'll come up with examples that refers to that. But that is only the first step, so then you need publicity. And the publicity is where the media comes into the picture. It's the idea of actors that, uh, for their own uh, function, for their own mandate, make information accessible and actionable by uh, other players, including uh, a citizen that can understand the information and change behavior. So the, the bank operates in an environment where most of the time these enabling conditions are not there, right? We work in developing countries, and uh, most of the features that you uh, debated, the, 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 the case of uh, uh, Hungary, I mean, is basically replicating many other countries in the world which uh, show all this kind of capture environment. But uh, regardless of the fact that the political institutions might be weak, uh, we still see that in, even in this environment, when you invest in a media campaign, and there's a lot of you know, growing evidence that media campaign in, in publicizing information can immediately change voting behavior. Even people that are supposedly uh, believed to be less receptive to this kind of behavior, and especially the poor. And in fact, uh, we, we, there are countries like, uh, there's a classic case in Rwanda, which is well known, where we were, sh we were investigating where, uh, the, whether or not the schools were receiving the grants by the central governments. So the schools are in, uh, entitled to receive some uh, grants for education, and they were receiving only 24% of the grants. Well, there was a media campaign that simply publicized, and so they, they simply published the amount of grant that each school was supposed to be uh, receiving, was entitled to. And the simple act of publication increased the grant to up to 80%. So this was a uh, was a f for the bank was you know it was a study was done uh, you know almost fifty years ago. All the rest had been, been lost in corruption. Yes, and there was uh, so everything. I mean, uh, let's say you are entitled in two hundred, you receive twenty four. So everything else was basically corruption and, uh, and mis uh, mismanagement. And the very fact that you had a media campaign that uh, and, and it's a very systematic uh, study, uh, you know, randomized controlled trials. So they were actually showing that uh, in schools that were in municipalities that were closer to a media outlet, so they were more exposed to radio, so they could um, get this information uh, more. Uh, they were actually the one where the effect was larger. And uh, and similar effect you see all over the world. You know, we we advert we we make the case in the report. That, uh, a wonderful example of Brazil where, again, there was this uh, alliance between the media and the national, the federal uh, audit, uh, um, audit the, the, the attorney general, so the, the auditor office, that basically run, uh, publicized information about uh, how um, municipal funds were used or abused by municipalities. And so they were basically, uh, by randomly, selectively, uh, they were randomizing uh, certain municipalities. You know, they got audited, and the results of it only were made public. And it, what happened in Brazil, there was a campaign where the media were using this report to uh, advertise before the elections what the mayor was doing. And the effect was, uh, was, uh, was uh, systematic and significant. The, in municipalities closer to media outlet, the corrupt mayor was mm, voted out. So the accountability mechanism uh, worked in many cases. Uh, we, we also know that it's not that simple. There are many other cases where this effect was leading to perverse dynamics. But the point I want to make is that uh, there, is a, there is a lot that media can do, and there's a lot they can do if the enabling environment is there. So if, if you, you know, if to make the next steps, what the bank can do, or what external donors can do in this, it, it, well, you can't do much in a sense that uh, given the fact that um, if you consider a simple statistics, uh, out of all the official development assistance that goes to uh, developing countries, the amount that goes to media, financial support, is 0.3%. These are OECD data. So in terms of direct financial support, is basically we are doing uh, zero. Uh, but this statistic, I think, can be misleading because, in a sense, it's not really the financial support that matters. In fact, in environments where media are captured, if you engage in financial support, you can become part of the problem rather than being part of the solution. So the idea is how to establish regulations 
that create like a competition and change the ownership. Now, there are um, areas where the bank is engaging uh, in creating this enabling environment through a lot of uh, mechanisms which we can discuss later. And one of these areas is transparency. So approving uh, access to information law has become, in many countries, a condition of bank loans. So in a sense, countries where they, uh, they negotiate policy reforms, and one of these policy reforms is the approval of the uh, access to information law, which we know in many countries is changing the game. I, 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 um, I may do examples. I just want to mention very briefly two more from Latin America. Countries where actually one, let's say, uh, countries where you would expect um, a lot of negative developments, a lot of uh, things that you know will take years to change. In fact, things are changing quite fastly, and this is the case of Paraguay, which approved an access to information law with bank support in 2016. And uh, as part of this access to information law, they also en uh, uh, they also enable another reform supported by the bank. Um, on open contracting. Open contracting means that you basically published online all uh, procurement uh, contracts and everybody can see who won and how much was the contract. Well, what happened was that uh, um, one day uh, the Ministry of Education had a, had a nice idea to organize a workshop to discuss policy reforms and uh, they of course organized lunch for the workshop. And um, it happened that the, the lunch, the cost of this lunch was uh, absurd. So in a sense the cost of the water was like 100 times the cost of the normal bottle of water. And so it was called the so-called uh, cosido de oro. So it was like a golden lunch. So what happened is that this information was known by everybody because of a small media outlets that w they took the job of going on the website where that information was simply available. They published the, the contract and they started a campaign showing that in a country where education the quiet education is one of the biggest challenges, and there was a lot of debate in the fact that school roof was uh, uh, falling. So there was a lot of uh, um, protest by students on the, on the investment, of the lack of investment. So that generated so much noise and so much protest, the very simple act of publicizing that information was already there, that the Minister of Education resigned. And, uh, and a similar exact, uh, effect was um, uh, took place in Mexico with a similar process which was looking at cash transfer that was supposed to go to certain farmers and then instead was captured by other farmers and again it was a media that publicized in collaboration with researchers that were able to analyze data at the same time you need skills. So uh, the point we make in the report that change is possible, it media play an important role but they are they maximize their effect where they build alliances and coalitions with other stakeholders and they, mm, we, mm, whether the business sector that has an interest in competition or whether they are um, uh, let's say researchers that have the ability to analyze data so there is a lot of reason for hope and um, yes so I, I think that's a, that's a that's a really good place to stop I mean to, to go to the next topic because it, it does show that in, and we saw, you know, in our work at at SEMA over the past couple of years, that these coalitions between civil society, media, and other people that are really critical in this uh, in governance environment that you're talking about, when they come together, they are able to pressure governments to make changes. And 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 when there is that kind of collaboration between. Uh, different players in this process, they tend to get better answers to the problems that they're trying to solve. Yeah. It's not a top-down process. It ends up being a, dis a, a, a collaboration and a discussion, and it is usually really critical. In, in the case of Uruguay, for example, it took almost 20 years for them to really change the, the uh, media law there in any significant way. They had a lot of problems of concentration and different kinds of capture in their media system, and that it didn't have a, an adequate implementation of the access to information law, but it was because civil society made alliances with different groups that depended on access to information and independent voices in that society. They came together, pressured the government, and, and, and in the uh, middle of the 2000s, they passed a series of, of media laws that really did change the way that uh, environment was working. So it, these coalitions are critically important. I'd like to, to think a little bit more about another really important area of governance, which is the governance of the internet. The internet mm -hmm. is the new place mm -hmm. where all of this is taking place. Mm -hmm. All of these transactions are taking place. 
And right now, it's a largely ungoverned space. It's a place where, uh, where some very large companies dominate. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a place where you can uh, very cheaply, almost with zero cost, disseminate to the global community any lie you want to tell. Lies are cheap. They don't cost anything to produce. Whereas high quality media, which requires reporting and people checking facts and having meetings and talking about what kind of, fo uh, what kind of focus they want to have are really costly. So the internet has incentivized the dissemination of, of very cheap uh, information, and most of them, a lot of which is uh, uh, highly interesting, apparently, to people, but which is often not true. <laughs> and this is, this is a big governance problem. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about that? Mm -hmm. And the questions about internet governance and how we manage that problem is one of the biggest things we have in our society today. And that's another big governance question for the, the role of media. Can we find a way to think about internet governance that, that incentivizes truth-telling, that, that creates incentives for people to put high-quality information out there? Are people willing to pay? for the, the reception of that information, or are we going to have to find some other way of, of, of organizing our information future? So I'd like to talk, and, and Miriam has been working on this as part of one of our strategic goals that we, we have at the National Endowment, and I wanted to, you to tell a little bit about what we're doing in that space. Sure, thank you for that. Um, so, yeah, so the, the, uh, the internet, the way we are approaching it in the strategic funds is looking at it from the perspective of civil society and the, the, uh, there's been a global uh, attack on civil society. There's been um, all kinds of um, areas uh, where over the last 10 years we've seen rights diminish and one of those leading areas is the internet. So when we're, we're looking at it, we're thinking about how best to preserve freedom of speech, privacy, basic democratic and human rights norms on the internet. Um, and we've basically um, identified three areas uh, where, where we think deserve focus. Um, and the first is norms and articulating, um, uh, bringing civil society together to articulate those fundamental values that need to be part of the space for civil society to be able to use the internet to, and I thought Rappler was a wonderful example of that. How not only the people spreading lies, but a scrappy NGO can become an agenda setter if they if they if they can figure out how to tell their story effectively on social media. So to be able to preserve that for civil society, what do we need to do? We need to be able to articulate these norms. We need to be able to bring people together and bring them into the key forums that determine the shape of the internet and that make decisions for the internet. It's very diffuse. It is a multi-stakeholder process and this is not an easy task, but bringing civil society and media into those decision-making bodies and placing them in um, a position to influence how technology develops, how standards develop, and how um, Shanti was already talking about facial recognition. And there's, there's new, uh, uh, after fake news come more and more problems. <laughs> um, how will uh, artificial intelligence be rolled out? All of these issues are being contested in different parts of um, the internet governance. There are several different bodies as well as the companies. So we need to articulate the norms. We need to be able to bring um, civil society and media from different places into those bodies and into contact with the firms and try to um, you know, impress upon them and, and work with them to find solutions. Uh, there's a whole drama playing out right now um, in, in Russia between Navalny's videos and YouTube. And YouTube so far has taken a courageous uh, uh, and principled stand and has refused to take down these videos even as um, the Russian government threatens to block them. Um, so, you know, it's, it, these discussions are incredibly important for our activists. 
Um, and the second, uh, not, not just for Navalny, but anybody who, who, who wants to use YouTube to spread their message in Russia or elsewhere. Um, and the third area uh, is tools. So you want to articulate norms, you want to bring civil society into discussions, into the key discussions so they can influence um, how policy is made and how tech is rolled out. And I should say that it's all very new. The technology is very new and the space is very new and it's changing all the time. So that very fact creates opportunities for us as well. And the third area is tools and that could be um, uh, better security tools, better tools for reporting, but really kind of um, helping to disperse innovative new techniques to civil society that, that, that need them. So those to are the monitor kind of what's major. going on and to be able to report to others who are watching from other perspectives what's happening in a particular country. And that cross-country aspect of the internet is something that we really have to fight for right now. Shanti made the point in, in the last session about how the uh, Chinese have, a, have an, uh, a vision of an internet that, is, uh, that stops at the border, that where the internet is controlled by each country. And that is an internet that would be incredibly damaging to global stability and to knowledge exchange, to all kinds of things like health and uh, uh, different kinds of um, uh, uh, global issues that uh, are really critical. So maintaining the open international uh, system is one of, the, one of those values that we, we really want to, to find. At the same time, we have to find a way to make the internet something that is not doing damage to everybody. So that is another question. That, and I wanted to ask Alex how you see this whole internet picture in your more um, human-focused uh, behavioral um, so way of thinking about it. Mark, it's a great but very, very difficult question, <laughs> as I'm sure we all agree. Uh, you mentioned the key word governance. And, and my World Bank colleague here I knows the definition of governance. But in essence, it's about power and not energy, political power. Uh -huh. uh, it's about market forces, and it's about human behavior. Yeah. So we at IREX run this program. It's a festival, actually, in partnership with the Department of State and a number of private sector organizations called the Internet Freedom Festival. It's an annual event in Spain, in Valencia, Spain, that is particularly focused on the global south and makes them be part of the discussion of the freedom of the internet and the governance of the internet. One of the things that we notice and we discover is that it's largely about inclusion. Frankly, the global south is not part of the internet governance and there's little to say in terms of effective power about how the internet is governed, so to be quite frank about it. Second, it's about who owns the internet. Um, you know, the EU is a trendsetter and a bit of a thought leader in this space. And they've taken a stance that segments of the important segments of the internet are in the public sector, are indeed public goods and should be seen as public goods. We're not quite there in the US. And in many parts of the world, this discussion is, is ongoing. Who owns the internet? You know, what remains in the public domain and what doesn't? Uh, and it's ironic that we're having this discussion about the internet because it started as a public sector investment, actually. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, the, the other element to this is. Uh, whether we have monopolies in the internet or not. Frankly, there's a lot of talk recently. There was some interesting discussion in Davos, brought up by George Soros, mm. uh, quite controversial, whether Facebook and Google are, are monopolies and whether they should be treated as monopolies under the current regulations that we have worldwide, including here in the US. Now, I'm sure there's folks on both many sides of, of this issue, actually, but it's, it's a discussion that is timely and worth having right now. And then a lot of it is about the human behavior. And, and frankly, we come back to the issue of the critical consumption of information. How do you behave on the net, actually? What skills do you need? What skills should you cultivate? Uh, and what skills you, you don't? Uh, in many parts of the world, including here at home, the internet remains the Wild West. Uh, it's, little, it, it's, it's not governed the, the same way we govern other public spaces um, in terms of free speech, in terms of behavior. Rules are simply absent. So I congratulate NED and SEMA actually for the work they're doing to include civil society and activists in the, the governance discussion. 
but, but it's one piece of it. We need many pieces to, to resolve the issue of, of the governance of the internet. To be honest, in the short term, I'm not very optimistic, but hopefully long term we will see movement in the, in the right direction. Tanya, you, um, you, you already started talking about how important this was for uh, keeping a, a semblance of free speech and uh, openness in the, in the Philippines context. Say a few words about how you see the internet as it, and, and what role it should play in a place like the Philippines. I think I'll, I'll, I'll take it a, a notch higher, okay. on okay. a higher level. of um, the, the field I work in is really more governance. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've crossed over from government, civil society government. And one of the thoughts that I've been developing recently is that it's very hard to talk governance when you're in a crisis mode. And so I'd, I'd like to apply that same frame to the internet right now and how we're approaching our roles in the internet, whether you're civil society, media, government, we're looking at it in a crisis manner. And therefore, our, our ability to look for the more long-term strategies to curtail whatever abuses may happen is limited by the dimensions at which we're looking at it. We're limited to security, we're limited to accessibility, we're limited to, it, it's, that's, that's way, it's a crisis way of looking at it. And so, um, and in the Philippines, it's compounded by the fact that that's not the only crisis we're facing right now. We, <laughs> we don't even have the luxury to think of governance, you know, as a crisis. We have <laughs> human crisis going on there. And therefore, I would say that also is a particularly challenging um, problem for democracy activists because we will be the first who will be hit <coughs> by the inability to govern the lost public space of the internet. Because what we would have earlier imagined as the leveling playing field for whatever we wanted to do is very quickly being won by other people who have less ethics, you know, less moral. <laughs> Uh, approaches to how they govern, quote unquote, this space, while we are still thinking mm -hmm. about how to yes. approach this problem. Yeah, that's a really important, really important point, uh, Marco. Yeah, well, I have a different perspective because, of course, I mean, we 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 think from a public sector perspective. So, in a sense, the the, the focus on the internet is indirect, if you want. But uh, there are two points. I mean, one is that uh, the um, there are some studies that show that uh, I forgot the details, at least one that actually we have in the report, and uh, that the credibility of the source is very important for, for changing or not changing people's behavior and beliefs. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, citizens are not that stupid. And uh, if, you, if you provide, so the study was looking at two different campaigns by two different NGOs. One was a very you know, well-established, credible, independent, and then the other was well, uh, partisan. And so if, you, uh, if the credibility of the source is, uh, is lacking uh, or is low, then the people don't change their behavior in terms of uh, voting behavior or in terms of uh, attitudes toward authorities. So the point is that uh, you, know, you might have a lot of fake news out there, but uh, in a sense, you know, the filtering is done also by who receives is more than what we think, because you know, credibility makes a difference. And if that is the point, then I guess the, the role for us is what uh, DFID is doing, uh, which you know is a, is a great initiative they have with the BBC Media Action. They, they, it's, it's about media literacy. So this is not just the internet, but media more in general, about educating medias to uh, analyze information and to make uh, investigative uh, journalists. So not just uh, um, having like scandals, but you know, being able to make the case and articulate it. So from our perspective, the point is to ensure and I guess this goes back to the point about Philippines. You know, from US, you might have a different perspective because you are a different uh, stage of development where these regulations are imperative because uh, this, is the, this is the problem you are facing. Most of the countries where we operate are not yet there. And so the, the idea, the priority to, uh, to bring change, to use governance for change, is to what we uh, articulate in the report as like reducing barriers for en of, uh, to entry for actors which are usually excluded, to be part of the decision-making process. And internet, in this sense, we show in the report, has been a, a huge benefit for people to reduce the, mm -hmm. to increase this contestability, because they cannot control the media market, they cannot control newspapers, but in a sense, had a democratizing effect. And on the other side, this is actually an interesting point that uh, uh, the experience of Malaysia, for example, shows that 
internet investment in internet infrastructure when we talk about uh, you know broadband and so capital investment to create the infrastructure sometimes are done for, for by government for totally different reason, having to do with accountability or the fact they are interested in that. So we, they, they might do that because, for example, they might be interested in promoting investment or they might have some other um, uh, interest, but they don't foresee the consequences this brings. <laughs> yeah. So and that was the case of Malaysia. The Malaysia uh, government invested heavily in the internet to, to promote private investment and foreign investment, in fact. And, um, and this study shows that actually once the infrastructure was there, people again started to use it. And uh, where the broadband was uh, disseminating, there was kind of a very nice correlation between the development of the broadband and the loss of support for the ruling party, because people started to uh, be more informative and use the internet for uh, uh, political campaigns. So um, I guess uh, the, the perspective is also depends on what stage of development you are, how competitive and uh, how pluralist is your society. And most of the societies where we operate uh, lack this kind of foundation. So in a sense, I, I agree regulations are important. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. they're not uh, something we should uh, consider, but uh, we are still in a more... <laughs> yeah, we're, and, and, and I think the, you know, just to be mm -hmm. clear, the kind of regulations we're talking about would, would certainly not try to do un, undo the right, things that you're talking yeah, about. Exactly, exactly. You know, we want to maintain the ability of people to hear different voices and to be able to have access to uh, different points of view and all that. No, ab absolutely. But the, the problem that, uh, that people are starting to see is that that um, diversity has recently been attacked by very large volumes of disinformation, right. very large volumes of false information. And that, that's where we are having, you know, we, we all thought that the internet would be the great equalizer, that it would be the yeah. organ, you know, it would be the, the means by which uh, villages in Africa and, and villages in uh, Indiana would get access to critical information about how to make decisions in their uh, local environments. Yeah. And for a while, it really did do that. It created enormous amounts of connectivity, and it, and it did empower many, many people across the world. We need to preserve that, because these big bot-led, robot-driven, robot automatic information campaigns that are <coughs> flooding the space make it very hard for those people to have the same uh, kind of access to that process. So, uh, you know, I think we all agree on that. Uh, it's not a... And something, that, Mark, mm -hmm. if I may, it has also challenged for good and for bad the market, the free market dogma in the following ways. As we know, the so-called independent journalism, especially here in the U.S., was largely advertorial-based. Right. Yeah. We're talking about advertisement revenue that was shared, you know, in a competitive way by media mm -hmm. outlets out there. Well, if you look now at the Internet, and we know who they are, they're controlling pretty much all of the advertorial revenue, yeah. uh, most of it. So is the market working in this case, or has it failed? Now, some would argue that, well, you know, the competition produced this current level of, uh, of affairs uh, with some dominant players that control the advertorial revenue. Some <coughs> would argue that the market has failed. The point of the market is not to produce monopolies. So it, it's, it's an interesting debate, actually, and I don't think we have clear answers or easy solutions. Yeah. And it's really important, I think, as, as Miriam said, to bring those Southern voices into this debate. Because one of the things that was really, you know, we, we brought about 10 or 12 um, Southern vo uh, players to the Internet Governance Forum in, Virgin uh, in, in Geneva, uh, in Switzerland, uh, last month. In, well, actually, it was in December. And it was so interesting to see how powerful those Southern voices were in being able to talk to all those techies and people from the North and people from Facebook and Google because they were, they were listening to people who had real experiences on the ground of what, what was happening to them. People who were running small news sites and because of a, of a decision that was made by some 20-year-old person in Silicon Valley one day, they lose all their audience overnight. <laughs> You know, and, in the, and Google doesn't even know about this. Yes. You know, those kinds of decisions that are being made by these companies affecting the democratic discourse in countries is a really, really critical issue. So having those voices there really does change the thing. And we were, you know, those people that we brought there to that meeting were really powerful. 
they had an enormous impact on the conversations because they could say, listen to what happened to me. And it's a big, big, uh, important kind of thing. I, I want to open it up to the room and ask if we have any questions so that we can uh, make sure we've covered things that uh, you're interested in. Um, what are your thoughts on this and what do you see from your perspective about internet governance or uh, the way the media systems are working? Please tell, tell us who you are. Hi, uh, I'm Kata Porter. I'm um, from Minnesota. I'm interested in um, the collection of data by, say, just like internet browsing and what we do on the internet every day. Like, most of my life is done by like, what I do on my computer just through school. Um, so, what effect does companies collecting that information and you paying that information have on? I guess maybe democracy in the future yeah. if the government is also collecting information from. Yes, that's a really important yeah. point, uh, Mary Milner. Um, sure. I uh, l look. We're we're looking right now, for instance, at Facebook that has now rolled out a whole new um, approach where they've said we're going to um, uh, make news less dominant and now it is all about quality time with friends and family. And there's one, you know, um, it, it, on one hand it makes it news organizations that have been struggling to adjust, it, a, a change in the algorithm creates all these um, obstacles for news media that, that had just adjusted to one uh, system, now they're in another one and they're being all media, not just fake media, are being kind of pushed aside. But at the same time, they're gathering more data about users. So that shift to quality time means that what is being um, kind of harvested is more multifaceted than just the kind of news that a person would, would, would uh, consume. So it's just, it's um, uh, trying to analyze this space and figure out um, how, how to approach it in a way that keeps the freedom. I mean, no one wants to regulate away any of the free speech elements, and especially not through um, you know, some kind of uh, high-handed uh, multinational um, controls, but, but being aware that there's always this trade-off, and that's what makes the advertising, that's what drives the advertising, is all the data that you're giving up for free. Most of the, you know, the problem that you're describing, you know, was really discussed quite a bit at the Internet Governance Forum, and the, and the trade-off between anonymity, you know, your ability to be anonymous on the internet, and, the, and the, the damage that's being done by anonymous players on the internet yeah. are, is one of the things that is really very difficult to solve. You know, because if you do away with anonymity, you're going to be restricting the rights of a lot of people, especially in closed societies. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to talk to each other. So this, this is a really big problem. How do we manage that? And that's one of the big debates that's going on right now. Do we, do we come up with some way for people to have some kind of, uh, to come up with some way of being able to trace back when somebody is, or some institution or robot system is pushing false information to the global uh, community at a time of crisis or trying to build a, a political change process. So that whole process, you know, that whole debate about how to treat personal information, the security of your information, who owns that information, that's what this whole internet debate is about right now. And it's very important for people to pay attention to this, to get involved in those debates, and to put your point of view into it. Because I think the big companies know what they want from this. The big companies know what they want. China knows what it wants from this. The, you know, the authoritarian governments know what they want. They want to be able to know what you're doing and to follow you and to have that information. So we're going to have to find some way of navigating this very complex set of questions that are the future of our democracy. That's this, the Internet is where the, our democracy is going to be formed. And we need to figure out how to, to be able to do that in a way that preserves freedom of expression and our you know, human rights but also doesn't let dark forces take over. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, 
I was just uh, thinking about the comment with respect to um, the priorities that uh, the colleague from IREX expressed. Um, you were saying that humans and critical thinking should be supported rather than AI uh, detecting fake news and, and misinformation uh, or healthy information for that matter. Um, humans have to learn to select and identify information sources, hate speech and so on. But actually, you know, the reality is humans create fake news. Human, humans create the AI that creates fake news. And there are some bad players out there. So you're talking about building up a peacekeeping force in this information war that we are really actually engaging in right now, uh, rather than actually figuring out how to fight the, the bad sources uh, that, that are harming everybody. Um, there's, there's also another aspect to that, and this is, you know, <coughs> The monopoly that we are talking about here, uh, say internet monopoly, it's not just the internet monopoly, it's a monopoly about you know AI and controlling the technologies and so on that actually is already a long time out of hands of the civil society. It's in the hands of big businesses, you need billions of dollars to run AI. Um, and uh, it's, it's just you know, an illusion that we can do that here at the local level. Even the institution like IU is not capable of building something that Google was capable of doing. Um, and it's money on the one hand, but on the other hand, what happened was basically a brain drain from civil society into these businesses. Uh, we lost last semester five colleagues in machine learning and AI from IU to Google. And uh, they, they have not been replaced. And, uh, it's basically happening on, on a daily basis. On a large scale. The, the experts are there and they are encapsulated in this type of private sector uh, uh, monopoly building uh, institutions.